This is a tier list and these are the Rolex models I am going to attempt to rank. Now after five months of discussing with friends as well as researching history, wearability, versatility and more, I finally decided to re-rank all Rolex models including even discontinued ones like the Cellini, Yachtmaster 2 and Milgauss. Without wasting any more of your time, let's get into the first model, an unexpected one, the Rolex Cellini. The Rolex Cellini, first introduced in 1968, is Rolex's line of elegant dress watches. It's known for its refined design, with features like a slim profile and classic styling, perfect for formal occasions. Now this is the one brand where I'm going to have to differentiate between modern and vintage. I'm going to be ranking these individually, whereas every other brand, the vintage history as well as the modern, go towards one ranking. Reason being, because of the stark difference between 2017 modern Cellini and vintage Cellini. Completely different, I don't even know why they called them the same model, because they're nothing alike. The 2017 Cellini is like the 1908. It's a dress watch that's on leather, it's a bit too big for a dress watch. Don't get me wrong, bigger watches should exist as dress watches for people, obviously with larger wrists. But a 40mm dress watch with these proportions, I mean, you have to have at least 8.5 inch wrists. So you just can't really have that many people wearing them. And for a Rolex model to actually be overall good and overall get a good ranking, it needs to have enough versatility and it needs to be wearable enough for a large clientele, not just a small niche of people. Vintage Cellini, however, is so cool. It is absolutely awesome. It's like the Cartier or the Piaget of Rolex, right? Funky, interesting, more statement piece designs. You've got stuff like the Rolex King Midas, the 4350, and plenty other just really interesting designs you don't see from any other Rolex. For these reasons, modern Cellini is going in the OK tier, and vintage to the class tier respectively. I will also mention that Rolex are very, very good watches. Even the watches at the very bottom of this tier list, the ones that I would pass on personally and that I think are the worst Rolex, are still like mid to high tier watches in general. All Rolex are good, robust, they have very good finishing, they have very reliable movements. You can't go wrong with a Rolex, so if a Rolex you love is placed in a bad spot, it doesn't matter, it's still a good watch anyway. Moving on to the Rolex Yachtmaster 1. Launched in 1992, it was built for sailing with a bi-directional bezel and solid water resistance. It's got a cool mix of sporty looks and everyday wearability. And the reason that I think this is quite a nice watch is because it's very similar to the Submariner, but it has a small niche subject about it that makes it wearable to a certain clientele. That being, of course, either yacht owners or just sailors in general. So whereas the Submariner is for divers, the Yachtmaster is for sailors. I think that's quite nice, having a distinction between two models, even though they're very similar. The Yachtmaster as well is generally made from much more interesting materials, like Everose Gold, Titanium, and Platinum, I do believe. And for these reasons, I am placing it in the incredible tier. The Rolex Yachtmaster 2, released in 2007, is all about timing regattas with its unique programmable countdown feature. It's a bigger, bolder, technical upgrade that is built for serious sailors. Even though that is the case, I'm afraid I'm going to have to pass on this, because I think that it is the worst Rolex design they have ever come up with. I think that it's just not very appealing to the eyes. Again, it's too big. It'd be fine if they made different size points for anyone to wear, but for a watch to be a good model, you need to have bigger watches and smaller watches so that a general range of anyone can wear them. You don't want it to just be worn by people with big wrists. And it's fine if you like this watch. It's still, again, a Rolex, good quality watch, etc, etc. But it's just not very attractive, it's not very wearable, and I don't see why you would get this over just a normal Yachtmaster 1. But for the sake of the ranking, I'm afraid I will have to pass. The Rolex Submariner, introduced in 1953, was the first watch to be water resistant up to 100 meters. It's the go-to dive watch, known for its durability and iconic rotating bezel. Now the Rolex Submariner needs no introduction, it's most likely the most recognisable and famous and popular watch in the entire industry. It's been worn by James Bond, it's been worn by every celebrity you could ever name, 
and it's generally a lot of people's first luxury watch. You cannot go wrong with a Submariner. Again, Rolex, amazing quality, etc, etc, but I don't need to say that, because all Rolex are. But along with that, it's the design, the wearability, and it's just... There's nothing to dislike about it. The only thing is, since it's such a safe watch, and since it's so popular, I just think that it's gotten a little bit boring. For this reason, even though it is a top tier watch, it's just gotten a little bit bland, needs a little bit of spicing up, and so I am putting it in the incredible tier. The Rolex Skydweller, launched in 2012, is Rolex's most complex watch, featuring an annual calendar and dual time zones. It's designed for frequent travellers, with a unique ring command bezel for easy setting adjustments. Now, I like this watch because it's like a larger date just for people with bigger wrists. That also has extra positives. Obviously, it's Rolex's most complicated watch, which is always nice to have. Complications are one of the main reasons you want to buy higher-end watches. And it's a very attractive looking watch as well. I do think it would be nice if they offered it in smaller sizing for people like me to wear it. But it's absolutely fine as it is since we have the date just anyway. But it's a very nice and unique watch. Big fan of it. And for that reason, it is finding itself in the incredible tier. The Rolex Sea Dweller, introduced in 1967, was built for deep sea divers with its impressive 610 meter water resistance. It's famous for the helium escape valve, which prevents crystal damage during the long saturation dives. Now this is a cool watch, but it's also not an incredible watch. Reason being because it's just a less wearable Submariner. However, on the other side, it is actually quite a cool watch. It's cool to have a watch that's very niche, even in a niche. Obviously, a Submariner, even though it's a dive watch, is generally just worn by people swimming, whereas this is a watch that actual divers would wear. Only thing is, it's not as wearable as a Submariner because it's just slightly larger, yet it has the same design. So overall, it's just a worse Submariner, although the fact that it is a little bit niche and has a little bit of fun going on about it does mean that it's not too bad. And for these reasons, it gets itself into the good tier. The Rolex Oyster Perpetual, first introduced in 1931, was the original waterproof automatic watch. It's all about simplicity, featuring a clean design, and Rolex's groundbreaking self-winding perpetual movement. This watch, there's not really much to say about it. It's very safe, like the Submariner. It's a little bit more versatile than the Submariner. It's a timeless design. It's just an all-round good look. What I want to say specifically about this is the newer coloured dials. I think that these are really, really cool. The green Oyster Perpetual, yellow, orange, pink, they're all very cool watches because they give a little bit of colour and fun to an otherwise very basic and boring design. Even though a design is boring, however, doesn't mean it's bad. Of course, this watch is absolutely incredible quality. It's got so much amazing history and you can't go wrong buying it. It looks good on any wrist. It looks good in any situation. And for these reasons, it finds itself in the incredible tier. The Rolex Milgauss, launched in 1951, was created for scientists and engineers, with magnetic resistance up to 1000 Gauss. Its standout feature is the lightning bolt seconds hand, giving it a unique look while protecting it against anti-magnetic fields. Now this watch is a cool watch, don't get me wrong. However, it's not as cool as it once was. Reason being, also I will say, I know it's not in production anymore, but the recent models, even though it does have something cool about it, which is its anti-magnetic resistance, that's in all watches now. Back when it was not in every watch, and this watch had that as a feature, that was interesting. But nowadays, there's no need for it. But it's still a Rolex in incredible quality, and I do like the fact that it suits a certain niche of people. I think that's always nice in a watch for you to have something that really connects with what you love. So if you're an engineer, if you're a scientist, etc, etc, it's a really cool watch to pick up. Placing it in the good tier. The Rolex GMT Master II, introduced in 1983, is a traveller's favourite with its dual time zone feature and iconic two-tone bezel. Designed for pilots, it lets you track down two time zones simultaneously and is known for its durability and legibility. Now this watch is really, really popular and really, really loved, and that's for a reason. First of all, having different bezels being two-tone and such, 
it makes it a lot more fun. They can come out with a new bezel insert to keep things fresh, as well as the fact it's just a generally really good looking watch on Oyster bracelets and Jubilee bracelets. It's versatile, it looks good on all wrists, it's well proportioned, it's not too big for what it's trying to be. There's too many things that there are to love about this watch, especially vintage. I think that vintage GNT Master 2s have some of the nicest patina. They look absolutely gorgeous. And the watch overall is just incredible. Placing it in the classy tier. The Rolex Explorer 2, released in 1971, was designed for adventurers, featuring a 24-hour hand and a fixed bezel for distinguishing day from night in low-light environments like caves. Its rugged build and extra time zone function make it perfect for explorers. For the same reason as the Milgauss, I think this is a really cool watch because it suits a certain niche of people. If you like nature, you go on hikes, you go caving, and you're generally active out in the wilderness, this is like the coolest Rolex ever. Not only that, but the Explorer 2 looks really cool, it has a really nice history, and it's just an incredible watch. All Rolexes are incredible, you can't say any are bad quality. Thus, landing it in the incredible tier. The Rolex Explorer 1, introduced in 1953, was inspired by the successful ascent of Mount Everest. It's a no-frills, durable watch with a clean and strong dial, with good loom, designed for adventurers who need reliability in extreme conditions. This watch is perfection. It looks good in every scenario, there's not a single wrist it doesn't suit absolutely perfectly. It's very versatile, it's a completely timeless design, it's on the more affordable side of Rolex as well, which is nice since it's a good entry point. It's a good one watch collection. You really can't go wrong with an Explorer 1. It's my baby and I love it. Placing it in the classy category. The Rolex Deep Sea, launched in 2008, is built for extreme depths with its 3,900 meter water resistance. It features again a helium escape valve and a robust case design, making it a top choice for professional divers. However, this is just the sea dweller at too far of an extent. Don't get me wrong, the Submariner is just these two, but slimmer and more wearable. But at least the sea dweller was just slightly going a little bit more in that direction. This, the deep sea, it just takes it too far. It is way too thick, it looks terrible on any wrist. It's just a really gaudy and horrible design. I think that if you want to get a, a diving watch you're actually going to use to its full extent, then the Rolex Sea Dweller is just fine. You're not going to go any further than like 600 meters in scuba gear. You'll be absolutely fine with that. You don't need to be getting something that goes four kilometers down into the water. I mean, this watch was just made to go deep in water so Rolex can say they've done it. It's not actually something that they were expecting people to pick up, and that's for good reason. But it's still a Rolex. It still looks good. It's just a slightly worse version of the Sea Dweller, which is a slightly worse version of the Submariner. So there's just not really any point for it. It's just going in one direction a little bit too far. Placing it in the I will pass category. The Rolex Daytona, first released in 1963, was made for motorsports with its chronograph function and tacky metric scale for measuring speed. Its sleek design and association with racing legends have made it a highly sought after classic. It's basically everyone's grail when it comes to Rolex. You have it nowadays on Oyster Flex with things like the Pikachu and the Ghost. You have lots of versatility in terms of wearability. It's the most popular chronograph design in the world. Maybe you could argue for the Speedmaster, but I'd say the Daytona is more recognisable. And I think it's probably the best, at least most harmonic, sport chronograph design in the entire industry. You can't go wrong with it if you can get your hands on it at retail. This is an issue because if you're not getting it at retail, it's two, three, four, five, six times the price, which it shouldn't be, and it's really hard to get on it. You need to be on a very long waiting list. But if you can get it at 14 grand retail, it's an incredible watch, absolutely class. And for that reason, it is the first watch going into the grail category. The Rolex Day Date, introduced in 1956, was the first watch to display both the day and date fully spelled out. Known as the President Watch, it combines classic elegance with a prestigious design often seen in solid gold or platinum, being worn by many US presidents. Now this watch, in my opinion, is Rolex's magnum opus. This is perfection. 
the top of the range, top of the mountain, absolute high end of Rolex. This is their best stuff. It's timeless. It really does portray luxury. Anyone wearing a day date is luxurious. You know, you don't see someone wearing it with a shirt on. You see someone wearing it with a suit. It really is the epitome of excellence, luxury and elegance when it comes to Rolexes, especially vintage. The 1803 or 1803 8, these, these ones with the stone dials, oh, they're just, <laughs> they're too incredible. They've got such gorgeous dials. I love it when you get vintage day dates with interesting finishing or bracelets like Bark, and they're so wearable. 36 millimeters works much better, even for larger wrists in my opinion, but if you prefer 40, that's absolutely fine. They're just a perfect watch. I don't think that there are many watches in the entire watch industry that come close to the day date, and for that reason, it goes in the Grail category. The Rolex Datejust, introduced in 1945, was the first watch to feature an automatic date change. Its timeless design, including the distinctive Cyclops lens over the date, makes it a versatile classic for any occasion. Now this is just the entry day date. I like the fact that they have more of an entry level and as well as this, the date just is lots of people's entry. A lot of people get a 1601 or a 16014 or even sometimes a six digit date just as their first Rolex because you can't go wrong with it. It's versatile, looks good, feels good, it's classy. It's the equivalent of a more dressy Explorer 1 or Oyster Perpetual in terms of the same price range, but a little bit more dressy with a fluted bezel and a Jubilee bracelet. It's a very nice watch. It's a little bit on the lower end of Rolex, but that doesn't change the fact that it's absolute class. And it's got some specific variations, which are some of the best watches in the world. I mean, again, stone dials, wood dials. If you're looking at the 6105, all of these versions are just incredible. Some of my grails, absolutely amazing, but not quite on par with something like the day date. Landing it in the classy category. The Rolex Air King, launched in 1958, is a tribute to aviation with its straightforward design and clear, legible dial. Known for its simple, classic look, it's a favourite for those who appreciate reliability and a nod to aviational history. In the same sense as the Milgauss, I like it because it suits a niche person. If you're an aviation enthusiast, this is the Rolex for you. It looks, feels, is the same price range and the same quality as an Oyster Perpetual or an Explorer 1. It's a very nice watch. I do think the green on the dial is a little bit spicy. I like it. It adds something, but it's not something I would personally go for. But if aviation's your thing, I have no reason to say don't go for it. It's an amazing watch, but I just think that there's better options in the price range, as it's basically just a less versatile Oyster Perpetual. Landing it in the good tier. The Rolex 1908, released in 2008 to mark Rolex's 100th anniversary, combines vintage charm with modern tech. It features a classic design with an elegant case and is a nod to Rolex's rich heritage. Sadly, even though the idea of this watch is cool, the execution, not so much. Just like the modern Cellini, it's too big for a dress watch for 99.9% .9 of guys. You have to be either morbidly obese or a seven foot giant to be able to wear this watch and have it look good. When you're wearing a dress watch, it needs to be understated. The whole point of a dress watch is to be classy, and the whole point of being classy is to be understated. You don't want a big plate on your wrist that shows everyone, oh look, I'm wearing a watch. You want something that doesn't go noticed unless you point it out. It's the whole point of a dress watch. And the 1908's design just isn't very nice either. As well as that, it is way too expensive for what it is. I mean, you know, we're talking about day-date levels of pricing and it's not even nearly the watch the day date is. Even though that's the case though, if you are big enough to wear it and you have enough money, it's not a bad watch, right? It's still a Rolex, it's still reliable, still looks good, it's still very classy, but it's just not what I would ever recommend to anyone or go for, landing it in the okay tier. Anyway, thanks for watching the tier list. Tell me what you thought about it in the comments below and have a wonderful day.